You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. I want him to go number one in the draft. As long as I go number one in the draft... And I signed the biggest contract I can. I lost the number one draft pick the night before the draft. I dropped six rounds in the draft because of that. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the thing that I said I was going to do because I want to cover more prospects. Prospect draft coverage show extravaganza 2.0 in the afternoon-ish, maybe. This is episode one. Of maybe one, maybe two. I don't know how this is going to go, but I enjoyed making the intro. It was fun. I wasted too much time. All that time that I said that I had, but it's gone now. Anyways, let us not waste any more time. Um, we're going to start ripping through some of these prospects. First up on the docket, we did have one guy on this uh, request list that thanks to a new entry list of names, we had two people requesting. I still don't know how you guys end up requesting these guys. It's kind of hilarious. He is number 232 on our consensus big board, edge rusher Robert Beal Jr. out of Georgia. He's a guy that plays opposite Nolan Smith. Robert Beal on the um, the Beast big board is ranked 28th among edge rushers. Six foot three and a half, 247 pounds out of Duluth, Georgia, 23.6 years old. Robert R.J. Beal grew up in Cordell, South Georgia, and primarily played basketball. He was also an avid bowler. But after he continued to foul out, he made the switch to football in sixth grade. He was homeschooled, started out playing offensive tackle, uh, wide receiver, tight end. But he liked defensive end because he liked the physicality. I dig that. Four-star recruit. Beal was a number eight weak side defensive end in the 2017 recruiting class. Number 11 recruit in Georgia with over three dozen scholarship offers. Had a choice of almost every program in the country. Alabama, Florida State, Clemson, LSU, Michigan, Ohio State, Stanford, Texas, USC. Initially went to Notre Dame but decommitted, and uh, blah, 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 he ended up going to Georgia. He was a part-time player at Georgia. Beal lined up at outside linebacker and co-defensive coordinator Will Muskamp's 3-4 base scheme. Former top recruit, he struggled to find consistent playing time throughout his career at the Bulldogs' loaded depth chart. He actually entered the transfer uh, portal, but then decided to stay. Overall, Beal is raw with his pass rush setup and execution versus the run, but he has the size, speed, profile, and splash plays that suggest he could be a better pro than college player. He's worth a gamble somewhere in the middle of day three of the draft, grade fifth, sixth round. Interestingly enough, he actually has him one spot ahead of Andre Carter, who has a 29th edge rusher. PFF doesn't even have him on their big board, but if we look at his five years at Georgia, you can see uh, all that inconsistency. His first year, he actually played a decent amount, 100 total snaps, had a 67 grade. Then he only played 60 snaps, had an 84 grade. Then 30 snaps, had a 55 grade. 2021 and 2022 is when he had his uh, first uh, real semi-part-time role. He had 69 and 67 grades. Overall, this year was uh, 67.8, 64 run defense, 56 tackling, 65 pass rush, 68 in coverage. So 60s across the board except for tackling. 26 pressures on 259 attempts. This is exactly 10% and only three sacks. Um, Pretty, I don't want to say inconsistent. He's right in the 50 to, I guess it's somewhat inconsistent. Um, If we run through his grades quick, 70, 50, 70, 70, 50, 50, 60, 50, 50, 60, 70, 70, 50, 60, 70. So 50s, 60s, and 70s. No 80s or 90s. No 20s, 30s, 40s. But still, there is no consistent like he's just good. 
if we round up the 69 grade, I think there's like six good games all year. Um, I did watch him. The, 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 <laughs> the funny thing is, he doesn't actually seem all that much different than Nolan Smith, who is considered a first-round prospect. I will acknowledge that Nolan Smith certainly is better at doing it. But if you look at guys that have like four, you know, slightly undersized and 4-4 four, four speed, they're the same guy. You know, Beal's slightly slower at 4-4-4, four, 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 but he's got two inches of height on him and about 10 pounds on him. So if I had to pick a player, it's Nolan Smith. Faster, bendier, stronger, surprisingly, at times. But if we're talking value, you want me to choose between Nolan Smith in the first round or Robert Beal in the fifth round? It's not remotely close, especially considering Robert Beal's ce- uh, ceiling might even be higher. Again, he's got 4-4-4 four, four, four speed. He is fast. He's demonstrated power on tape, speed catching running backs from behind. He looks like a prototypical Georgia edge rusher. Small, speedy guy. So was I blown away by him? No, I think he's a kind of a one-trick pony. He's unrefined, but I don't dislike him at all. And again, as far as value, it's really, really not even close to me. I would be much more comfortable with Robert Beal in the fifth round than Nolan Smith in the first. Um, next up, we're kind of at my discretion here because we're out of the duplicates. So what I think I want to do is stick with your recommendations, but go back to the order. In other words, the, the highest ranked guy that you have requested. So next on our list, who was actually request, requested by somebody out there, is Kendra Miller. Kendra Miller is a running back out of TCU. He's listed on Dane Brugler's board as running back number eight. He is one spot ahead of Israel Abanakanda. He is several ahead of Kenny McIntosh, who I think we covered. Is that who? No, Dane, Dwayne McBride. Same thing. Same distance. But uh, running back out of TCU, 5'11", 215 pounds. I, I dig that size. Slightly smaller, but stacked. You know, I should say jacked. It might have the wrong connotations. I don't know. Uh, out of Mount Enterprise, Texas, 20.8 years old is another uh, solid plus. Kendra Miller, who has a sister, grew up in a small town in East Texas near the Louisiana border. His love of football started at age six when he continued to play throughout elementary school. Dominated like everybody else on here. District MVP 2019. All state honors. Lettered in basketball and tracks at personal bests in the 100 meter and high jumps. Three-star recruit, Miller was the number 125 athlete in the 2020 class, the number 220 out of Texas. Remarkable production in high school, but played in Class 2A, one of the smallest classifications in Texas, which scared off some college programs. Offers from Southern Miss and Wyoming before developing a connection with UTSA head coach Jeff uh, Trailer, but TCU came in late and he decided to flip. A one-year starter at TCU, Miller was the lead back and former offensive coordinator Gary Riley's RPO-based offense. He was pushed up the Horned Frog's depth chart when Zach Evans bolted for Ole Miss. Miller responded with 1,399 yards in 2022, which is the most by a TCU player in more than 20 years when LaDainian Tomlinson led the country in rushing yards. Wow. Overall, Miller is a work in progress as a receiver and blocker, and his decision-making as a runner has room for improvement, but his lower body agility, acceleration, and natural balance are traits that can upgrade an NFL backfield. Not being able to work out pre-draft might hurt him a tad on draft weekend, but he has NFL starting talent third or fourth round. He doesn't, yeah, he didn't do anything because of a right knee injury, um, aside from height, weight, arm, hand, and wingspan. Uh, PFF has Kendra Miller at number seven running back, number 97 overall, so still top 100. I dig it. He has comps by them to Miles Sanders, which is solid. Where he wins, flexibility. What's his role, bell cow. Where he can improve, short yardage. Grades, 88.5 rushing grade, 61 receiving grade, 80 zone, 86 gap, teen run block grade, 66. Miller is an ascending running back, won't turn 21 years old until June, who has one of the most well-rounded skill sets in the class. Dang. Three years at TCU, his grades, 73, 82, and 85. Um, His snap counts went from 77 to 112 to 270. Uh, Rushing attempts, 50, 83, and 224. Um... 6.2 6.2 yards per attempt, 6.7 career average. Had uh, the 1,400 yards, 17 touchdowns, two fumbles in that season. Seven games, he went over 100 yards. I love, 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 love the week-to-week consist. I, I hope I like this guy's tape because I'm falling in love with everything about this guy. Not even 21 years old yet. Solid football player. Overlooked. Freaking best player TCU's had since LaDainian Tomlinson even go to TCU? Is that what they were saying? I guess. 
I didn't think he went there. Anyways, on a week-to-week -week basis, he is just solid 70s almost every week with the exception of a couple mid-to-high um, 60s. The only n game that doesn't apply to is Kansas State, but it's just 60, 70, 70, 70, 70, 60, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 60, 65, basically. I mean, just rock solid. And again, for my own personal preference, give me this guy over the guy that has like 50s and 40s mixed in with like 90s and 80s. I love the 90s and 80s, but I, I just hate the inconsistency. I hate the really bad games. Just give me a pile of guys like this that are solid, that you can rely on them every single week. I dig it. And again, another thing that I really like, first of all, consistency from year to year, which he has. Second of all, getting better every year. I mean, he has checked every single personal box that I have. So I'll say this. I like but don't love Kendra Miller. Um, I think he's good in just about every category, which is consistent with what we talked about. But the fact that you've got, again, I don't see any real injury history. He's gotten better every year. He's only 20 years old. I think there are going to be some limitations, uh, some ceiling stuff there in terms of not really having elite agility or certainly not elite speed. Again, he hasn't run anything, but if I had to just take a wild guess, I'd be surprised if it was lower than the four fives, you know? He's not running away from anybody. But I do like him. Mid to late mid-ish, sort of just a solid guy to put in your rotation. I think he'd be I think he'd be solid. I'd have no issue taking Kendra Miller to put him in there with Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon. That's what I'll say. Next up we've got uh who's the next guy on the list, number one twelve on our consensus big board. I know JJ was the one that I believe JJ was the one that recommended him, but Luke Schoonmaker. Kind of surprised there was only one. But I have certainly been chomping at the bit to take a closer look at Mr. Schoonmaker, or as I like to call him, Schoonman. Schoonman. Kind of sounds like he's saying it. Like if you think Schoonman and then you listen to it, sounds like he's saying Schoonman. But anyways, um, number seven tight end behind Sam Laporta. He is a tight end out of Michigan, six foot five, two fifty one, out of Hamden, Connecticut. Twenty four and a half years old. Luke Schoonmaker, who is the oldest of four kids, grew up in Old Saybrook, a coastal city in southern Connecticut along uh, the Long Island Sound. It's a lot of information about where he lives. Started playing around fifth grade, played quarterback, et cetera, et cetera. Basically played every position that there is. He also lettered in basketball. Three-star recruit, Schoonmaker, number 39, tight end, 2018 recruiting class, number three recruit in Connecticut, behind Will Levis and Josh Joby. Um, his father, Scott... Currently, the school superintendent at North Bradford played college basketball at Assumption College from 82 to 86. One of the top rebounders in school history before playing professionally for one season in Brazil. Younger brother Jack was a walk-on defensive lineman at Division II St. Anselm. Currently second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. His youngest siblings are twins. His sister Lily was an all-state high school lacrosse player in 2022. And his brother Mark is a standout tight end and defensive end at Hamden. There you go. Two-year starter at Michigan, Schoonmaker was the Y tight end in Coach Jim Harbaugh's power spread offense, lining up primarily in line wing and occasionally in the slot. Overall, Schoonmaker is only average in most areas, but he has the size, speed, and strength to be a solid possession receiver and positional blocker. His well-rounded game will help him become a steady number two and potential number one tight end for an NFL team, third round grade number 90 overall. Uh, PFF also has him as the number seven tight end, number 96 overall, very similar. Player comp is Luke Wilson, where he wins football IQ, what's his role in line tight end, where can he improve playing through contact, receiving grade 78.7, run blocking 55, that's surprising, red zone grade is a 63, contested catch rate is just 28.6. As far as his uh, testing, Schoonmaker was a pleasant surprise with his 4.63 speed 40-yard dash being one of the fastest of the tight ends in attendance. For an ideally built tight end, uh, that's a great number. Helps project him as, as a downfield threat. So uh, just looking at the percentiles, his 4.63 40, it was just above the 80th percentile. 20-yard shuttle was just below it. Broad jump was about a 90th percentile at 10 foot 7 inches. Broad, uh, the vert, 33 and a half is about the 50th percentile. It says Schoonmaker is a high floor tight end who should be a day one starter. He did, by the way, improve his vert from a 33 and a half to a 35 and a half. And he did a uh, three cone at 681. Um, as far as PFF, he has been there five years, really only played in any real capacity in the last two. But the um, 
Overall grades are a little bit staggering when you look at it. It's 56, 57, 41, 55, and then a 72.7 this year. Even if you really only say he's been playing the last two years, it's still 55, 72. So that's a little bit troubling in terms of being afraid that it's somewhat of a fluke. The one good thing is he clearly got better as the season went on. It was 60, 60, 60, 70, 60, 60, 40, 60, 60, 70, 70, 70, but even the, the 60s in between, like it started off low 60s and then went to high 60s. He did have the 43 in the right in the middle against Penn State, which obviously is terrible, but relatively consistent and ascending. But again, it's just the one year. Um, his receiving grade went from a 61 to a 78, and his pass blocking went from a 61 to a 79, which is great, except for the part where pass blocking isn't really what tight ends do. What they do is run blocking, and he had a 55 grade. In fact, he's had a pretty bad grade since forever. 55, 51, 49, 50, and 55 have been his run blocking grades. Again, surprising because I thought that was his claim to fame. Special teams is uh, looking just average, although he does have a decent amount of experience, so that could be a possible thing. I don't know, man. I'm I'm, I'm a little bit torn on Mr. Schoon, man. One minute I look at him like, dude, this guy can't even block, and then the next, like, seven plays is like, all right, no, he, he can then it's like, well, I, I like him as a receiver. Like, he looks like he can really fly. And then you watch him, he's like, he looks really slow and kind of lumbery. And then there was the first, one of the first, well, the first reception he had was a touchdown. This was against Maryland or something. But he had a just a simple out route. He made it look so laborious and difficult, slow and wide arcing. And then it hit him right in the chest and he dropped it and fell over on his face. Like, this is sad. And then a couple plays later, he's like running down the field gets into a safety's chest or something and breaks to the outside and outruns him and catches a diving pass. And it's like, well, that was super impressive. So, I mean, the, the best I can say is that he's six foot five, two fifty one, 251, runs a four, six, three. And I think you're going to get from him what you get from a guy who's six foot five, two fifty one, 251, and runs a four, six, three. He's not necessarily going to outrun anybody, but he has the size to be able to outmuscle people. You know, again, they, they, there's that tight end trick where you run into a guy and then you come out of your break and they're trying to like recover from falling backwards and then they can't really quite catch up if the quarterback can put the ball where it's supposed to be. But again, I mean, you can do that with 4-7 speed. And so I, I don't know. He's, he's definitely not the best blocker. He's definitely not the best receiver. He's definitely not the fastest. But if I, I, I guess if you miss on the top, what is it, four that I have? It's more for other people, but you put him on sort of a second tier in terms of a guy that could probably do some stuff. Who would I compare him to for the Packers? Richard Rodgers or something? You know what I mean? Like, you don't love Richard Rodgers, but he's there. He's doing stuff. He'll get that third down for you. It's like, that a boy, Richie. I'm not saying it's a great comp. I'm just saying, like, that's kind of where I expect his NFL career to be. Basically, every tight end the Packers have ever had is, is what I'm trying to get at. That guy that you wish was better, you definitely want to replace, but hey, thanks for being here and doing what you can while you're here. Packers trying to find a tight end is like a restaurant trying to find a chef and they just can't find a guy, so they just have this line cook, just microwave and stuff, and you're like, nah, you're doing great, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. We appreciate you. Don't worry about all the complaints, and we'll deal with the complaints. You just keep being you, man. It's great. Microwave bacon, nice and crispy. It's great. Just, just crank it out, bro. Next up, again, is a guy that uh, is just next in line. So we did 111, 112, and now 113, Zach Pickens. Zach Pickens is a uh, defensive tackle listed as defensive tackle 9 by Dane Brugler out of South Carolina. Still trying to find me a defensive tackle. Zacchaeus Zach Pickens, who has an older brother, grew up in Anderson. Did I say 6'3 and a half, 291 out of Anderson, 23 years old? Anyways, just like everybody else, started loving football in elementary school, blah, blah, blah. First from his school to win South Carolina's Mr. Football, took home the Gatorade South Carolina Player of the Year, South Carolina Lineman of the Year, Under Armour All-American Honors, five-star recruit out of high school, number one defensive tackle in the 2019 recruiting class ahead of DeMarvin Leal and Trayvon Walker. That's pretty dope. Number one recruit out of South Carolina, obviously. One spot ahead of Cam Smith, number eight recruit in the country. Three-year starter at South Carolina, Pickens lined up primarily near the A-gap in defensive coordinator Clayton White's even base front. He is the third-ranked recruit to ever sign with the Gamecocks behind Jadavian Clowney and Marcus Lattimore. Statistical resume did not live up to the hype, but he was a dependable interior lineman the last four seasons. Overall, Pickens must continue to hone his hand technique as a rusher and anchor in the run game, but he plays on his feet with agility, balance, and length to instinctively react to blockers. He projects as a rotational tackle 
as a rookie with starting upside, third round grade number 83 overall. Uh, PFF has him as the ninth ranked defensive tackle, number 110 overall. They comped him to Taquan Graham. As far as where he wins, his uh, he played most over the B-gap, but that was his second lowest graded position, which could contribute possibly to why he didn't grade out as well. 483 snaps over the B-gap, 61.8 grade. The next highest was only 96 snaps. He had a 76 grade. Over tackle, 23 snaps, 77 grade. And then outside of the tackle, he just two snaps doesn't really count. Where he wins with power, what's his role, versatile project, where he can improve motor. Pass rush grade 75, run defense 60, true pass rush grade 65, pass rush win rate 11.6%. Pickens has a ton of work with, uh, a ton to work with as a defensive tackle. Flashes are on tape too. He's definitely a riser. 40 yard dash time was a 4.89, which is fantastic. 20-yard shuttle and vert were mediocre. Bench press of 22 reps is really low. Broad jump, 9.8 is about 90th percentile. Three cone, 7.45 is about the 80th. They go on to say the flashes are first-round caliber, but the down-to-down effectiveness did not even uh, stand out in college. One of the more head-scratching prospects in the class. And then, yeah, PFF just absolutely couldn't stand the guy. Four years in South Carolina, 63, 62, 61, and 67 overall grade. Run defense grades, 58, 64, 57, 60, so not good. Tackling has been bad every year. Coverage obviously is bad, but who cares? Pass rush is the only somewhat redeemable thing. Uh, The last two years, 70 and 75, but he only had 19 pressures on 292 attempts. That is horrific. That's really, really bad, and three sacks on top of that. As a pass rushing interior guy at 291 pounds, to be at 19 pressures out of 292, you should be closer to 30. You got 19. I'll say this, though. I don't mind Zach Pickens all that much. And, and here, here's the thing. Um, for, for just about every position, I have some kind of a weakness. In other words, if you can check these boxes, I probably like you even if you're not super good. For defensive tackles, it's pretty simple. Beat the guy in front of you. Demonstrate to me that you're bigger and stronger and can control the man in front of you, and, and you have my respect. And Zach Pickens does that. The ultimate example of this for me is Rennell Wren. He was a fourth-round pick. Uh, nobody expected much. He came into the league. He has not been very good. But you know what that dude did? He freaking dominated the guy in front of him every single time. I don't know if there's such a thing as a penetrating run defender, but that's sort of what I see Zach Pickens as. It's it's strange because he's way bigger and stronger than the guy in front of him. And he can not only hold his spot, but he can throw the guy around. But he doesn't seem to have, despite the fact that his 40 time or whatever isn't, not that it's 40 yards to the quarterback, but maybe it's an explosion thing. I don't know. He doesn't seem to get to the quarterback very fast. There is another thing, though, that I that I find good and potentially could be better. I couldn't figure out why the guy just couldn't seem to produce. He'd beat the guy in front of him. He'd be able to shed the blocker, or at least, you know, how you shift over to the other side to where the running back's going, you stick your arm out. But he just, it's like he had short arms. He couldn't quite reach the guy, and I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized he can't reach him because there's so much space. And what do they say about South Carolina? You don't get a bunch of ranked guys there. It's, it's, it's not a really high-ranking group of guys. Everybody else is getting pushed out of the way, and he's got to cover way too much ground. Now, if you have a guy on your left and a guy on your right that are able to actually stand their own ground so that you only have to do your job, not your job, and the guys next to you's job, there's a pretty good chance he can do a decent job. The weird thing about Zach Pickens, though, is that he's, what, 295 or something, expected to be a pass rusher, and he plays like he's a 320-pound run defender. So it is a weird thing. Um, I like his pedigree. I like that he beats the guy in front of him. I don't know exactly what you do with it, but if we get him, I'm just going to be like, yeah, dude, he's, he's, let's, let's say he's Mike Daniels, right? Mike Daniels is a late round guy. He was undersized wrestler, but he was just bigger. Or I should say bigger. He was, he was, he just had that violent mentality. He was going to whoop the guy in front of him. So we'll just hope that he becomes something along those lines. Next guy on our list would be Zach Evans, but we have zero requests for that. Who is our top 30 visit? Where's JJ's list? We'll do either requests or top 30 visits, although I think most of the top 30s have been requested. It looks like the next one that was actually requested, we got to scroll a little bit, but it's Mr. KJ Henry. He is listed by Dane Brugler as the number 20 edge rusher um, out of Clemson, so buyer beware. Six foot four, two fifty one, out of Winston Salem, North Carolina. Twenty four point two years old. Keith Jeremiah K J Henry, one of four kids, born in, born in Southern Ohio, where his father was an assistant football coach under Jim Grobe at Ohio University. Uh, when he was two, his family moved there. So his uh, 
No, there's a connection to Wake Forest. I don't understand how that works exactly. Five-star recruit. Henry was the number three weak side defensive end in the 2018 recruiting class, number 14 overall, number two in North Carolina behind Zamir White. His goal was to play college basketball. He received offers from several uh, lower-level Division I programs, and then his football recruitment exploded, and he's like, all right, I guess I'm playing football. His father was an All-American safety at Catawba from 85 to 89, where he set school records with 398 tackles. Played two seasons in the Arena Football League. Then he spent the next 32 years as an assistant coach at the college level, including stops at Gardner-Webb, Charleston Southern, uh, North Carolina A&T, Ohio, Wake Forest, and Catawba. Charlotte from 17 to 18, Western Carolina from 2019 to 2021. So this is all very recent. It says Keith underwent surgery for a kidney transplant July 2022, and he used an NIL deal to help raise $100,000 to aid with uncovered medical expenses. That's pretty wild. KJ's younger brother, Isaiah, is a high school junior and a basketball recruit with an offer from App State. He has a degree in sports communication, added a master's degree in athletic leadership. That's probably a good thing to have, I guess, assuming, you know, it's useful. One-year starter at Clemson. He was left defensive end and defensive coordinator Wes Goodwin's multiple fronts. Overall, Henry isn't the biggest or fastest and isn't built to be an every-down impact player in the NFL, but he plays with burst, hustle, and no... Uh, know-how to break down the rhythm of blockers in different ways. He has the tools to compete for a sub-rusher role as a rookie. PFF has him as the number 17 pass rusher, number 92 overall, so PFF actually likes him a little bit more. Player comp is Whitney Merciless, so now you're getting me excited. Um, His highest graded position is also where he played the most, which is outside of the tackle, 83.6 grade. Where he wins hands, what's his role? Edge with inside versatility. Where can he improve winning the edge? 84 pass rush grade, 79 run defense grade, 90 true true pass rush grade, 16.3 pass rush win rate. All of that sounds great. Uh, he posted an oddly slow 10-yard split for how fast his 40 was. Henry doesn't win on pure athleticism, so average testing isn't the biggest deal. Uh, he did have a 4.63 40-yard dash time. His vert and his broad jump were very low, which is explosion, which I think goes into the 10-yard split right? That that initial explosion, that burst is not great, which by the way, saying that that's not a big deal for a pass rusher, I think is completely false. I think that's a pretty big deal for pass rushers. But anyways, they said overall, Henry is a high floor edge rusher with the NFL ready, uh, with an NFL ready game. He just comes with some question marks in his prospect profile. Aside from the Clemson red flag, there's uh, a couple others. Five years at Clemson. So there, there's also the age. He's 24 years old, five years at Clemson, Four years as a starter, his his first three of those four years, 62, 62, 66, and then 83. So he exploded kind of out of nowhere. Additionally, although the grades are actually quite good, the consistency still is somewhat of an issue. So the lows are actually not terrible and the highs are quite good. But just running through it, it's 80, 50, 60, 70, 70, 70, 80, 80, 50, 70, 70, 60, 60, 60. So you can kind of live with it when the lowest is 53. There's only two in the 50s and then, you know, even the 60s, and a lot of them ended up being kind of high, but you got high 70s and then multiple 80s, which I haven't really seen in a while. It's, it's not terrible. But again, 24, his fifth year, kind of came out of nowhere. Right, His run defense grades went from 57, 57, 61, 80. Like, what? Tackling, 42, 67, 65, 80. Pass rush, 64, 59, 69, 84. And ultimately, it's, it's on the back of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight good games. I mean, that's, that's not a necessarily a small amount, but how much stock over four years are you going to put into eight games? Just makes me nervous. I'm actually surprised how much tape there is. I don't know if it's just because it's Clemson or if he was considered a higher prospect at some point, but considering how many good games he has and um, how, many, how much tape there is, it's a pretty good opportunity to see some pretty good games here. Oh, by the way, before we get to that, 53 pressures, 380 attempts, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Five sacks is not the greatest, but I, I generally don't care about that. I care more about pressures. So my thoughts with Mr. K.J. Henry, um, he honestly kind of reminds me of some of the wide receivers in this class. He's a smaller guy, and the size negatively impacts him, and he doesn't necessarily have the upside of what a lot of smaller guys have. So with the wide receivers, it's like, okay, they're a little bit smaller, but they're super shifty and speedy, right? Like, well, no, but they're pretty good route runners and fairly fast. Like, well, what the heck is that? 170 pounds and you're a good route runner and sort of fast? That's stupid. KJ Henry is a 
somewhat undersized guy at 250 pounds off the edge. You can definitely see that negatively impact him in terms of beating the guy in front of him. But he also doesn't exactly have some gr real good bend. He really doesn't have the explosion that I just talked about. He doesn't have very good closing speed. I don't really super dislike him, but he's so, I guess, just sort of average. And I just feel like when you go to the next level, if you're only 250 pounds and you don't really have top end speed or bend to kind of take the corner and you don't have the power to go through them, I mean, maybe you've got good enough speed that you get the stunts and twists going or whatever. You can kind of do some damage. Some of these guys, you know, they kind of knife between the tackle and guard and can kind of get that get off fast enough. I mean, you can do stuff occasionally. I just struggle to think that you can do those things consistently, especially when you're talking run defense. So like a lot of guys, I don't hate them. But you're talking a lot of things I don't like. 24 years old, um, just the year prior, 2021, he really wasn't very good. There is some inconsistency on week to week. He's undersized, doesn't have really top end anything. I don't really hate anything, but nothing is, is every, every single thing is sort of, I wish it was a little bit better. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and take a break right here. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you'd like to support the podcast. Um... Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. You can check them out at FertileGroundRanch.org. That is the charity we are supporting. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. All right, next up on our big board, as far as guys that have been requested, is Mr. Nick Broker, offensive guard out of Ole Miss. I will say, I do like my Ole Miss guys, so this is probably going to be something I like. Six foot, four and a half, 305 pounds out of Springfield, Illinois, 22 and a half years old. Nicholas Nick uh, Broker, I was saying it right, who has one older brother, grew up in central Illinois and tend, uh, attended Sacred Heart. Lots of football stuff, obviously. Four-year letterman on the basketball team, led the squad to 21 season as a senior. All-state honors with 16.7 points, 9.5 rebounds per game. Three-star recruit. Broker was the 35th offensive tackle in the 2019 recruiting class, number five recruit in Illinois. Grew up in Big Ten country, attended Iowa and Northwestern games throughout his childhood. But he was uh, he got a bunch of offers, Illinois, Michigan, whatever. But he was drawn to coaches and environment of Ole Miss and committed in June 2018 prior to his senior year. Ohio State made a late push, including uh, head coach Ryan Day attending one of Broker's basketball games, but he stayed loyal to Ole Miss. That's pretty crazy. It's like, yeah, I like these Midwest guys, Illinois, Michigan. It's like, yeah. But then you get Ohio State coming in. That's a big deal. His father, John, played defensive end at Northwestern from 87 to 90. His older brother, Jack, was a walk-on offensive lineman at Illinois. Based on feedback from NFL teams about his lack of length, Broker moved from left tackle to left guard as a senior. Three-year starter at Ole Miss, Broker was primarily a left tackle. Moved to left guard as a senior uh, in head coach Lane Kiffin's offense. Helped block for the offense that ranked number three in the FBS in rushing yards per game. Fourth Rebel ever to win the Kent Hull Trophy, top offensive lineman in Mississippi. How is it the fourth ever and it's just a Mississippi thing? How many colleges are in Mississippi? Mississippi State and Ole Miss, right? What else is there? I don't know. It's probably, there's got to be a big one or something. I, don't, I have no idea. Overall, Broker doesn't wow with his explosiveness or power, especially in recovery mode, but he is strong and understands his responsibilities, which helps him execute when his technique and leverage stay on point. He projects as a potential NFL backup on the interior in either a zone or gap scheme, fifth round. So another guy that PFF does not have on their draft guide, but as far as his PFF grades, really underwhelming, uh, but consistently underwhelming. Four years at Ole Miss, his grades 54, 59, 68, 65. Run blocking grades 56, 63, 65, 62. Pass blocking did take a big jump after his first two years, 51, 51. 
and then 75-72. Didn't allow any sacks in 2022. Um, His grades, really, really underwhelming as far as uh, week to week. He had one game as an 80.2 against Georgia Tech. His second highest graded game was a 67 against Central Arkansas. He also had four that were below a 60. One of them was in the 40s against LSU. As far as my thoughts, I honestly kind of like the guy. Um, I don't know if uh, Vanderbilt just has garbage competition. I mean, he didn't grade out very well. PFF doesn't agree with my assessment. My, my biggest thing with him is his balance. He seems very wobbly, if I may use my own made-up uh, scouting terminology. But um, no, I mean, he, he blocked everybody. I thought the movement looked good. Um, it would have been nice, you know, to see him kind of, I'm sure if I can find, you know, what LSU is here. Give me, give me 10 minutes here. No, I stand by it. I mean, this is his lowest graded game. Um, Primarily run blocking was the issue, but I I just, I don't really see a massive issue. I wanted to watch LSU, not just because it's better competition, but I want to see him against bigger guys. A lot of the Vanderbilt guys were a little bit more slender. And I thought maybe you go up against like Jacqueline Roy, who we still haven't talked about. A uh, big boy inside. I thought maybe that's where he would start to struggle. It really wasn't. Not that he's undersized. I just thought, you know, there has to be more to it than this. Um, and I just, I don't really see much of an issue, even with the movement. I mean, his ability to move to the outside. Again, the only real issue is sort of the balance, and it's hard to even explain what I mean by that. You know, sometimes you get into those hand fights, and one of those defensive tackles will kind of throw you to the side, and he's kind of a little top heavy there. Uh, a couple times I've seen him, it, it, he just kind of starts to fall over at really weird times like he shouldn't. But balance is 100% a technique thing with an offensive lineman. I mean, it's a critically important thing that is coach. So even that is is low on my list of concerns because it's not an inherent trait. I mean, maybe just some, you know, some inner ear deficiency or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, he, it, is, am I going to kick down the door and scream for this guy? No, but I, I think he's fine. I have no issue with Nick Broker whatsoever. Next up on our list, I wish I would have done a better job of keeping track of who re- recommended these guys, but we have Parker Washington. He is at uh, number 127 on the consensus big board. He is Dane Brugler's number 20 wide receiver out of Penn State. He is 500 and, uh, 509, five foot nine and a half, 204 pounds from Sugarland, Texas. 21.1 years old. Christopher, excuse me, Christopher Parker Washington, who has an older sister, grew up in South uh, Southwest Houston, played football at a youth level, often coached by his father, Christopher. A four-star recruit, Washington was the number 45 wide receiver in the 2020 recruiting class, number 40 recruit in Texas, behind Quinton Johnson and Jackson Smith and Jigba. Ayo. His older sister, Ashton, worked for the XFL in 2019, Illinois in 2020, Texas Tech in 2021, and is now the player personnel coordinator for the Chicago Bears. Wow. Well, if his ability to play football is on par with his sister's ability to acquire uh, pro personnel talent, I don't want him. You know what I'm talking about, Nikhil Harry? Equinemius? Freaking like 70 different receivers that suck? (laughs) I'm just kidding. His father, Chris, played college football for Mississippi State and Air Force in the early 1990s. His cousin, Joshua Dobbs, was a fourth-round pick, number 135 in the 2017 draft for the Tennessee Titans, and has played six seasons of quarterback in the NFL. That's funny. His cousin, Tyler Tolbert, played baseball at UAB and was picked in the 13th round in the 2019 MLB uh, draft by the Kansas City Royals. His cousin, uh, Stephen Dobbs, played baseball at UAB. Washington elected to opt... uh, Oh, never mind. We're just moving on to something else. So not only athletic family, but like like legitimately getting to the next level athletic, not like played for some Division III thing 17 years ago. A three-year starter at Penn State, Washington was an inside receiver in offensive coordinator Mike Urisich's RPO-based scheme. Overall, Washington has subpar length and only average speed at the position, but his agile footwork, instinctive ball skills, and competitive toughness help him to create opportunities. He is best in the slot and projects as a Golden Tate-like target, like everybody else in this freaking draft. Fourth, fifth round grade. He also didn't run any agility things or anything at the workouts at the Combine or Pro Day due to a left ankle injury. PFF has Washington as the number 17 wide receiver, number 132 overall. Player comp, get ready, Amari Rogers. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, if you look at it, they, they have this route run heat map thing. It's all inside stuff. So that whole thing with Aaron Rodgers never throws middle of the field and Jordan Love does. Therefore, an Amari Rodgers type guy might be more beneficial. That, so there you go. He is all about middle of the field and wide receiver screens. Where he wins, yards after the catch. What's his role? Complimentary number two or three. Where he can improve route breaks. 
Receiving grade, 76-7. Receiving grade versus man, 74. Versus zone, 75. Contested catch rate is 71.4%. How big is this guy? He's uh, five, nine and a half, 204. Okie doke. Overall, Washington's ball skills and yard after the catch ability will cause NFL teams to covet him, but his stock could have seriously benefited from another season with the Nittany Lions. Um, looking at his grades, first of all, he has done some returning, mostly as a punt returner, which makes sense, but he did have one kick return. Punt returns, though, uh, 18 this past year for 103 yards. Uh, 30 yards was his longest. 5.7 yards per attempt is his average, and he does have one muff punt. So, man, the Amari Rogers comps here are just wild. <laughs> but uh, 2020, so three years at Penn State, his grades... 66, 81, 76. So the last two years have been pretty solid. Consistency is kind of terrible this past year. 50, 80, 70, 60, 70, 50, 70, 80, 60, 50. Don't like that so much. His biggest game, if you're interested in checking it out, actually came against Ohio State, which is a big deal because a lot of times these guys will go up against and kind of get their really good grades by beating up on these lower level guys. And then their Ohio State game is their one game where they had like a 24 grade or something and it's like yeah you're not going to be very good are you but his highest graded game and he had 11 receptions for 179 yards and a touchdown but i tell you what man i uh i mean it was his highest graded game i did get to see the ohio state one i like him but but like a lot of these guys it's not well because of his stats or because he played any particular kind it's it's kind of like i talked about before when everything starts to come together i'm starting to get it so my initial thought when I saw the guy is he's an undersized receiver, right? The way everybody talked about him, he's a slot guy. He's five foot ten, et cetera, et cetera, right? Here's the thing though: the guy is two hundred and four pounds. Now that might not seem that amazing, like well, two hundred four is not that jacked. It is for a five ten guy. Generally, when you're talking five ten, you're talking much smaller. Right? If we look at last year's draft class, um, the guys that were five ten or uh, or shorter, the guys that got drafted. 195, 178, and 170. Sky Moore was 5'10", 195. So 10 pounds less. The only person to get drafted since like 2003 who's been 5'10 or less and 204 and more, and you're not going to like this, it was Amari Rogers. But here's, here's the reason I like it. He, forget Amari for a second. Yes, the comps and all that, it makes sense. By the way, conceptually, we all liked Amari Rogers in terms of like what he was supposed to do. He plays like a smaller guy without the downside of being too small. I really like his footwork. A lot of times when I'm watching guys, for example, on curl route, for me, it's, it's a matter of like how laborious was it for you to gear down, like stop your momentum and turn around. Parker Washington might be, I got to go back and watch, you know, I'm assuming JSN is quite good at this and stuff. He's the best I remember that I remember. I'll just leave it at that. You know, again, first round guys I haven't watched in a little while now. It's been, what, like a week? It's hard to keep it all in your head, but he's really good at it. I think his route running is incredibly smooth. But the great thing about him is it's not like a lot of other small guys where it's like, yeah, but he gets jammed up in man coverage. He's a big dude. And one of the first things I noticed because I, I forgot about his weight is I was expecting him to not be able to block and he was running out to go block and I just skipped it. And I'm like, well, don't skip it. Go back and actually watch him, see about the effort or whatever. He actually did a great job blocking. And throughout the game, I thought he did a really good job blocking. So it's this really cool combination of he is a more compact guy, so he's more agile. He's able, and he's not too heavy, but he's not too small either. He's he's you know I mean two hundred four is pretty standard for a wide receiver. He's got plenty of weight. He's got plenty of size, and being smaller to the ground, he's got a little bit more leverage. So it, it's almost like the best of both worlds. And the balance I think is incredible, which goes into the route running. But also go look at the play that I posted on Twitter of him. It's against Ohio State. But first of all, the play, it's, it's kind of hard to tell on Twitter because it's so choppy when the video actually gets uploaded. But the way he kind of lunges and snags, and then he gets hit and stays on his feet and is able to keep running. He's got incredible contact balance. There's a lame buzzword for you. But he does. So I really like him. I don't know what his speed is. Um, and the height seems like it could be a problem, right? Obviously, you'd like a taller wide receiver. But considering he has a 75% uh, contested catch rate compared to some of these guys that are six foot four with like 23 percent contested catch rates i i like him I, I part of it is just conceptually right if we could bring that similar to amari right if we could bring that to life everything that we're talking about i think he could be a really good wide receiver so i'm on board man i like parker washington i like the wide receivers i really like a lot of these guys
Next up, we have another wide receiver. This time it is wide receiver number 19, actually one spot ahead of Parker Washington. Wide receiver out of Virginia, six foot one, 206 pounds. He is from Plaquemine, Louisiana, 21.8 years old. Dontavion Wicks grew up in uh, south of Baton Rouge and developed a love for basketball through his childhood. Played JV basketball in high school, wanted to play it in uh, college. As a sophomore, Wicks was coaxed into football by uh, his quarterback half-brother, Trey LeBlanc, and saw immediate varsity reps as a wide receiver. Three-star recruit, Wicks was the number 88 wide receiver in the 2019 recruiting class, number 24 recruit in Louisiana. The uh, idea of playing college football became a reality during his junior season when he picked up several low-level offers. As a senior, several FBS-level programs showed more interest. Virginia was his only Power 5 scholarship offer, so he accepted that. Two-year starter at Virginia, he was the ex-receiver in head coach Tony Elliott's pro-style spread offense. He put his name on the early-round NFL draft radar as a junior with a school record 1,203 receiving yards, including 27 plays of 20-plus yards. But his senior year was the opposite in terms of production as he struggled to match his junior year's success. It's really weird. Overall, Wicks' evaluation is complicated because of the night and day difference between 2021 and 2022 performances, but the raw talent is there for him to continue ascending as he polishes his game. His development potential will understandably capture the interest of NFL teams in the top four rounds, third, fourth round grade. Uh, PFF does not have Dontavion Wicks on their draft guide. And then, yeah, it's really just two years at Virginia, and you've got an 80 grade and a 59 grade. I mean, what do you do with that? Receiving grade went from an 80 to a 58, 1,200 yards down to 430 yards, nine touchdowns down to two touchdowns. Drop grade went from a 58 to a 26. He had nine drops. He's actually got a lot of really high drops. I mean, his total career drop percentage is 14.3%. That's really not good. He also has fumble issues. Uh, In both years as a starter, he had a 28 grade and a 32 grade as far as fumbling. And then looking from week to week, it's real bad. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 60, 60, 50. He didn't have a single good game the entire season. I think it's the first prospect we've seen with zero good games. Georgia Tech was his best with a 68 grade. Only game I have available is Dontavion Wicks' game against Illinois. 13 targets, two receptions. It says only one drop, but that's brutal. In fact, he had 72 targets and only 30 receptions. He caught 41.7% of his targets. I don't know if they have a garbage quarterback or what. So I'll be honest, I tried to get there. When I first started, I watched the guy and I thought, this is the worst wide receiver that I've seen. I mean, there's nothing redeemable here whatsoever. And then he ran that one route and it's like, oh, hello. Then he did it again. And it's like, all right, there might be something here. He's got that shiftiness that makes you go, I bet he's got a really good three cone. Just plant that one foot and get inside real fast. He was able to shimmy shake his way open a couple times. The problem is, first of all, it was, it was far too few times. A lot of times he's just doing this little, like, no plan going into how I'm going to get open, shake and bake nonsense, and ends up just plowing into the DB and just looking for a flag. Like, what are you doing? Then you look at his four six two speed. And I got to be honest, this might sound absurd to some people, without even reading into... Um, any scouting reports or whatever, my first thought that comes to mind is, how much does he want it? He's got some incredible ability that he's not putting on the field, not even once this past year. He's a guy that wanted to play basketball his entire life, but couldn't quite cut it as a basketball player. He was forced into football by his brother, didn't want to play. Turns out he's really good at it, but does he even like it? Then you look at his drop issues, his fumble issues. These are concentration issues. You look at him having no route running plan whatsoever. He's not trying. This is a guy just going out there just freestyling, hoping that things fall into place. So I I don't, even when I tried to get myself to say, you know, maybe if you can get a commitment and say, this guy's all the way in and and you can commit to him actually putting his best foot forward. What is his best foot forward? He's 6'1", 206, runs a 4'6'2". He's going to play like a small tight end. He's going to get that quick cut and just, you know, get the ball in there, timing route type thing. Because even the few times he does get open, the recovery from the cornerback is easy. So I, I just there's there's nothing here for me. I see it. I see the little the, I see the little shimmy shake. I see that nice little route. Usually when I see that that little jaw dropping thing, I'm all the way in. But there's just too much here to be like I, I don't know what to do with this. All right, let's do one more, and that's going to be the next guy on the big board at pick one or at uh, number one thirty, and that is Nick Herbig. 
Dane Brugler's number five linebacker out of Wisconsin, six foot two, two hundred and forty pounds. Originally from Kauai, Hawaii, twenty one point four years old. Nicholas Nick Herbig, youngest of three boys, born and raised in the Hawaiian Islands of Kauai. Played multiple starts, starting uh, multiple sports at age six. My brain's gone. I'm sorry. You're going to have to bear with me. We've reached that point. For the Herbig boys to play high school football at the highest level, the maternal grandparents moved uh, from Kauai to Oahu, allowing the boys to move in with them and enroll at St. Louis School, a Catholic school in Honolulu that has produced several NFL players, including Marcus Mariota and Tua Tungavailoa. Interesting. Four-star recruit, Herbig was a number nine outside linebacker in the 2020 recruiting class, number two in Hawaii, behind Notre Dame linebacker Jordan uh, Botello. Got a bunch of impressive West Coast offers, including Cal, Stanford, UCLA, USA, USC, and Washington. However, Herbig had his mind set on creating his own path at a culture-rich program away from the Pacific Ocean, despite never traveling to the med- Midwest. Um, he loved his recruiting trip to Wisconsin prior to his senior year and committed before he got back on the plane home. That's cool. His older brother, Nate, was an all-Pac-12 guard at Stanford. He signed with the Philadelphia Eagles as an unrestricted free agent, playing three seasons, 2019 to 2021, with the Eagles, before signing with the Jets in 2022. That's funny. Two years ago, his mother and father bought a home in the west side of Madison, where they live in the basement, while Nick and two teammates live upstairs. That's hilarious. We lived on the west side of Madison. I wonder if they were living close by. I never think to look at the, uh, I, I don't go through the whole thing, but some of the weaknesses do have some of the off-field stuff that just it just caught my uh, caught my eye. I should have been paying closer attention to that. But he was suspended one game as a senior in high school for an off-campus fight and missed one game in uh, his junior year because of a knee injury. Three-year starter at Wisconsin, Herbig was a stand-up edge rusher in former defensive coordinator Jim Leonard's 3-4 base defense. He was a frequent visitor in the opponent's backfield and led the Badgers in sacks each of the past two seasons. Overall, Herbig isn't built to handle multiple gaps or align in closed areas in the NFL, but he has an explosive get-off hand usage and backfield instincts to pester quarterbacks. I thought you said he was an inside linebacker. (laughs) I'm confused, but whatever. While currently not a true every-down NFL player, his impact will be felt as a sub-rusher and offers additional value if he evolves his off-ball skills. Okie dokie. Third round grade, number 79 overall. PFF uh, has him as the number 11 linebacker, number 58 overall. How many freaking linebackers do you have? Something's not right. But anyways, it doesn't matter. One of the best pass rushing linebackers in the country, player comp Joe Schobert, where he wins block destruction. What's his role? Off-ball linebacker, where he can improve reps. 91.1 pass rush grade, 76 run defense grade, 24% pass rush win rate, which, again, this whole thing is weird because apparently he's an inside linebacker. Uh, Herbig is one of the few players in the class to show up bigger at the combine than what he was listed at. Um, 240 pounds is 12 pounds heavier than what Wisconsin listed him at uh, last season, season, which makes his 1-5-9-10 yard split all the more impressive. His short arms are still a worry for him to stick at edge defender, however. So apparently people still aren't sure where to put him, so I don't know. Herbig is such an unknown at this point that it's hard to see a team drafting him with a premium pick, but boy, is he an intriguing athlete. Nick Herbig, obviously, when you go back to the PFF grades on their main website, he's listed as an edge because that's what he did in college. On the draft guide, he's a linebacker. So I mean, this whole thing feels so useless. Elite edge rusher uh, in his three years there, the last two years, 83.6, 87.4. Pass rush grades, 91.4, 91.1. Top to bottom, just freaking elite. 41 pressures on 208 attempts in 2021, and then 34 pressures on 194 attempts in 2022. Career total of 80 pressures and 21 sacks on 542 attempts. That's psychotic. But you're telling me he's an inside linebacker, so what does that mean? As far as my thoughts, I mean, it's 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 a tough evaluation for the reasons that I've already stated. Um, there are instances where he, for example, will drop into coverage. So you kind of get a little chance to see that. I did think he took on blocks, you know, for, so for example, setting the edge, he does a, a pretty good job with that. And so you factor in that as a linebacker, I think that'll work to his benefit. I, I, from the standpoint of, could he just stay at edge rusher? I wasn't a huge fan of him as an edge rusher. So the, the thought is, well, would you just move him inside? He could be a linebacker and just a really good pass rusher on the inside. 
Again, really small sample size, but I didn't really like him in space. So, for example, he'll drop in coverage and then somebody catches a pass and he has to go get him. That's more of a linebacker thing than what you see from an edge rusher. He looks like an edge rusher. The way he moves is kind of like stiff and weird and robotic and, you know, linebackers tend to be a little bit more smooth, generally speaking, especially in today's NFL. And I, I, I would just be kind of worried with him. I could potentially see the upside, you know, if he could play linebacker. He's, you know, Wisconsin is kind of, they, they have those interchangeable outside-inside guys. Their pass rusher is a little bit too small, but they'll probably have some pretty good inside guys. And, and I think the inside guys actually do translate pretty well to the NFL. But he's not a true inside linebacker, and he hasn't been trained that way, and we haven't seen him that way. And just in the tiny flashes, I just kind of struggle. Aside from his ability to take on blocks and shed blocks to make tackles and all that, I thought that was fairly good. But to be able to move in space, I mean, I, I want to see him read a play and react and shoot a gap or, or, or take off to the sideline and cut a guy down. And I, I'm sure he did it at some point. And if anybody has a clip, they could send it to me. I didn't see it. So the tiny bit I saw, it made me a little bit nervous. And I just, I, I, it's, it's too much of a gamble. If I have an entire staff like Brian Gutekunst has, sure, we can break everything down. And I'm sure he has the ability to break down what specific plays he played and what, like PFF will do that for for uh, pro teams. They've got incredible all this stuff. And then they've got film on every single game of every single player. They can pull it up a little click, 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 and they can see all that stuff. So they can pull up every single run play Nick Herbig played from the inside linebacker position. And they can study it and get a really good... I can't do that. So from where I'm sitting, I don't see any reason to to do this. I'll just call it, I guess, an incomplete grade. So probably had time for one more, but I, 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 you know, again, we're doing a ton of different things here. We've got the original podcast. We've got the breaking news podcast. We've got this podcast, and I still have to do Packernet After Dark, and it's getting late. So I got to get out of here. You guys have your uh, yourselves a good rest of the day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. We'll see how many podcasts I can pull off tomorrow. We'll have a lot more free time on draft week, but uh, still, this is a lot. But have a good night. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.